brings our chaos back into order. Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us today. If you are a guest, thank you for coming. You could be anywhere in the world today, and you chose to be here, and we are just grateful for that. Thanks for coming. If you're looking for a new church home, we are always looking for new family members. Love to hear what God's doing in your life, and we can share with you what we think he's doing in our church, and love to just join that journey together. So thanks for coming. There is a card on the seat in front of you. Uh, you can uh, put, uh, take one of those, fill it out, put it in the collection plate when it passes in just a few minutes. If you have a prayer request, please indicate that on the card. We'll be praying about those first thing tomorrow morning. If you're interested in learning more about Twickenham, put that on the card. We'll give you a call this week and set up a time to, just to have a conversation. So really glad you're here. Hey, we're really glad that one of our members is here this morning who has not been with us for many weeks. And in fact, we... There were times when we didn't think she'd ever be back, but she is. Carlene Kessel is here. Carlene, just wave. We're going to give you a hand. We're glad you're here. Good to see you again. So I got three things that when I was thinking about them early this morning, I thought these are not related. And then I thought, yeah, they are. So here they are. Here are the three things that don't seem to be related, but more deeply so than, than I think any of us imagine. First of all, we are going to uh, extend an invitation this morning. And in our uh, fellowship, uh, that would, if you're Baptist, that'd be called an altar call, okay? Um, but at the end of the message this morning, we're going to give everybody a chance to respond publicly um, to say, hey, I need prayer or I'm ready to give my life to Christ in baptism. We don't do that every week, but we're going to do it this week. It seemed inappropriate not to, given what's been going on in our church, what's going on in our country this week, and the focus of our service and message this morning, which is on grace. So the second thing that doesn't seem to be connected, but really is, is that something special seems to be happening on Wednesday nights here at Twickenham. Uh, the last several weeks, we've had moved our instrumental service, the spring, to the Wednesday night time slot, and um, we've had bigger crowds, than we've ever had on a Wednesday night. And I don't think it's the Steel City Pops. That's what I've heard, but I don't think it is. And in, in that hour, there has been something significant going on. A lot of you have mentioned this feels big and deep and spiritual. 
And so I just want to urge you to, you should be a part of that. You should be a part of that. We, we meet at 6.15 for light desserts, and then at 6.30 the worship begins. We're in a teaching series called What Would Jesus Ask? And the focus is on the piercing questions that Jesus asked people in the Gospels. And it has been deeply spiritual. So you, you need to be there Wednesday night. So here's the third thing. Um, The events in Charlottesville, Virginia this weekend. Um, Three people are dead following violent outbreaks at a neo-Nazi white nationalist rally. Two Virginia state troopers were killed in a helicopter crash on their way to do their jobs at that rally. And then a 32-year-old woman was killed when a man drove his car into a crowd of counter-protesters and he appeared to do so with the intentional purpose of hurting people. And he did. About 16 people are in the hospital and this 32 year old woman who has yet to be named is dead. Um, there's a passage in Jeremiah 17 chapter, chapter 17 verse nine. I, I'd love to tell you that there's no place in the United States for that kind of hate, but apparently there is. Jeremiah 17 nine says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Now that's from the old King James Version, but sometimes we need to take those old Bible words out and dust them off and use them because they tell the truth. And the truth is the people who were marching this weekend in Charlottesville are deeply deceived and their hearts are filled with wickedness, which is what makes what we're doing this morning and on Wednesday nights and in this church every week really, really important because we are here to tell the message of God's grace and God's mercy and God's love. And that's the message that needs to get out to everybody. In the very next song that we're going to sing, let me ask you to go ahead and stand up if you don't mind. In the very next song that we are going to sing, we're going to sing about the sun of God's love and the light of God's spirit and the God of all grace. This world needs more love, this world needs more light, and this world needs a lot more grace for everybody. What this world and this country and this state and this city and this church and your house and your heart and mine really need is revival. We need a revival of light and love and grace. And that revival has to start. If it's not going to start with God's people, where is it going to start? So everything we do this morning is a prayer. Everything we do this morning is a prayer for revival. So pray hard this morning, church. Worship hard this morning, church, because we need that revival. Let's sing. Let's pray. Let's worship. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thy glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thy glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Spirit of life who has shown Joy of the Lord will be my strength. 
the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Would you be seated as we take our offering? More like you, Jesus, more like you, fill my heart with your desire to make me more like you, Jesus, more like you, Jesus, more share this morning from Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourself it is the gift of God not by works so that no man can boast when I was a kid I grew up in a small town in Louisiana and uh, often as you can imagine a lot of times the summers there were unbearably hot I have very fond memories of my grandparents, and and luckily when I was growing up, I had both sets of grandparents alive until after I went off to college, and I had some great memories of of both sets of my grandparents. Um, One of the things that I I remember the most is I would often go to my grandparents' house, and I would cut the yard, and I would weed eat at edge, I'd do the whole nine yards, get down the ditch, clean out the ditch and everything, work two or three hours, and come in. My grandfather would give me $10, okay? And so typically what would happen after something like that, my grandmother would come along and say, hey, sweetie, come here and let me give you $10 more, okay? (laughs) She said, I know it's hot out there, okay, and your grandfather doesn't pay very well. I'm going to give you 10 more, yeah, I'm going to give you $10 more. Now let's just keep this our little secret. Yes, ma'am, okay, I knew how to play the game, all right? And then my other grandparents lived probably four or five miles away, not too far away at all. And my grandfather, my other grandfather on my dad's side, he had a tradition. He had this green ceramic frog that sat on his front porch. And once I started driving, I started getting around, 
He would leave me gas money underneath this frog, sit on the front porch, okay? $10, $20, and back in that time, $20 bought a lot of gas, okay? And so all I'd have to do is just drive up, check under the green frog, $20, put it in my pocket, go on the way. Didn't have to do anything, okay? Pretty cool situation there. And he just, you know, he, he felt that was his way to contribute, to help me out. And both of those situations, okay, I like to think of that as, as how God takes care of us with his grace. Um, a lot of times we get more than we deserve. Um, like I did with my, my grandparents cutting the yard, got more than I deserve. Sometimes and every time we cannot earn it. We don't earn it. It comes from him. We cannot earn it. We just do nothing. He gives us that grace. And so we should be thankful for that. We should worship him knowing that we can't earn it. It's not anything that we can do. It should not be expected. It just comes from him. And that's the greatest blessing of all. And the one that we're looking at this morning is to sacrifice Christ upon the cross for our sins. And as we partake this offering this morning, let's think of that grace and let's think of the sacrifice that Jesus made that we can never, ever repay. Let's bow, please. Our most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time as, as Christians we can gather here today and we can think about the sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross. And as we partake of this bread, Lord, help us just to remember that sacrifice and to know that your grace covers us and that we, don't, we can't earn it and we don't deserve it, Lord, but we're very appreciative of the gift that comes from you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Be still, my soul, redeeming love. Out of the dust of Calvary is rising to the throne of love.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this um, cup, uh, and as we as we partake this cup, help us to think of Christ's blood shed up on the cross for our sins. It's in his name we pray. Amen. When my accuser makes the claim that I should die for my offense, I point him to that rugged frame where I found life at Christ's expense. See from his hands, his feet, his side, the fountain flows. speaks for me. Worthy is the Lamb, Lamb for sinners slain, Jesus Lord of all, glory to His name. Heaven crying out, let the earth proclaim, power in the blood, glory to His name. I stand redeemed, the blood of Jesus speaks for me, amazing love, how can it be, the blood of Jesus speaks for me.
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for your love for us and your willingness to do what was necessary in order for us to be clean and to be saved. And we wish that it had been as inexpensive as laundry, but our sin was much worse than mud. And yet you were willing to pay an ungodly price to save us. And we're thankful for that and pray that we will find it within ourselves through your spirit to extend that same grace to others. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll eventually be in Luke chapter 15 if you want to turn over there. It'll be a little while yet. Um, Years ago, far enough back that my boys were still tax deductions and they were not on my cell phone plan. So they were too young to have cell phones. So that's that far back. There was a young athlete who was taking the world by storm in an unusual sport for taking the world by storm. It was golf. And the athlete had a weird name, Tiger, Tiger Woods. He had just burst onto the scene and began winning tournament after tournament after tournament. And every kid in America, maybe in much of the world, wanted to be Tiger Woods. And my boys were not immune to that. They, they wanted to be Tiger Woods. And so I bought them some starter golf club, a starter set of golf clubs each and would take them to the driving range and we would hit golf balls and I'd help them work on their swing. And we just, it was a good father son kind of thing to do. And their mother started playing golf. And so we could go out as a family and it's nothing like taking your fights at home and moving them to the golf course in public so that everybody can see it, right? So things don't always turn out the way you wish they would. But so the boys and I had been playing golf one afternoon or the driving range one afternoon and we, we came home, took the clubs out of the car, put them in the garage, left the garage door open, went inside, had dinner. And so then I said, guys, you need to go out and get your golf clubs and clean them up because that's the deal. If we're going to use these tools, then we have to take care of them. So go to the garage, get your clubs, clean them up. So they went in the garage. They came back into the house and said, dad, we can't find our golf clubs which is not unusual because in my house, I'm the finder. How many of you are the finders in your house? Just curious, okay? We're the ones that can find stuff nobody else. My mother was the finder at my house. I'm the finder at my house. So I went out to the garage kind of going, you know, and to get to find the golf clubs. And sure enough, they weren't there. Someone had come into our garage and stolen the boys' golf clubs. What really hurt my feelings was they didn't steal mine, right? Apparently mine weren't worth it, but they stole the boys' golf clubs, and, and I was livid. I felt deeply violated. And the, actually, the whole family was a little bit afraid. Who has the gumption to come into somebody's garage and steal something? We, we filed a police report. They told us it was not likely that we'd ever find who did it because, you know, you just there's no evidence, nothing to pursue. They did say you might want to alert the local used sporting goods stores and the pawn shops because sometimes people will go and try to fence the things they they steal. So I made, uh, I went on, you know, printed up pictures, went online and found pictures of the boys' golf clubs and and was going to take that to the pawn shops and used sporting goods stores. And that night, I just lay in bed seething, just angry, and I began to play out all these scenarios about what I would do if I caught the person. Have you ever done that? Somebody did something to you and you just kind of play out the scenario. Here's what I would do if I caught them. And I just, I went through all these scenarios. And then I realized there's a sermon there. What would you do if somebody stole something from you and you caught them red-handed? You have three options. Your first option is justice. So imagine this. You're on your way to a pawn shop to give the proprietor of the pawn shop a description of what was stolen from you, the golf clubs. 
And you walk in and there they are. There's the kid who stole your golf clubs, trying to sell them to the pawn shop. You, and you grab him, right? You grab him. And you tell the store manager to call the police while you hold him. And when the police arrive, you turn him over and watch him being handcuffed and put in the back of a police car. And you show up at court for the trial, and you describe in vivid detail how violated your family felt, how your kids didn't sleep that night, how you bought a security system and put up cameras, and how what we need in this country is stiffer sentences and more courageous judges and getting tougher on crime. That's justice, getting what you deserve for the crime you committed. Your second option is mercy. Again, you catch the culprit red-handed, this time in the parking lot of the pawn shop. You walk up to the kid and you say, hey, those are not your golf clubs. You stole those out of my garage. I ought to call the police right now and have you arrested, but I'm a nice guy. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go easy on you. I'm going to take these golf clubs back. I am going to tell your parents about what you did, and I don't ever want to see you on my street again. Believe it or not, that's mercy not getting what you deserve. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. The kid deserves to feel, to, to feel the full experience, uh, to fully experience the consequences of his actions, and you have the power to administer those consequences, but you don't. Mercy. There's one other option. This one's called grace. This time you're in your backyard. You're up on a ladder installing a new security camera, right? And you look across the backyards of several neighbors, and a few houses down, you see a neighborhood kid chipping golf balls in his backyard with your kid's golf clubs. Now, you know this kid. His family struggles. The kids are always on their own, practically raising themselves, and strangely, you feel compassion for him. So you climb down off your ladder and you walk over to his yard. You don't really sneak, but you don't announce yourself either. And his back is to you as he addresses the golf ball and he's saying something. You lean in closer. You hear him whispering, I am Jordan Spieth. I am Jordan Spieth. And he takes a cut at the ball and Jordan Spieth he ain't. He drops the club on the ground disappointed because he missed the ball entirely. And then you speak. So you like Jordan Spieth, do you? And he turns around to see you there and he freezes and he casts a guilty glance at the golf clubs and hopes you won't notice. You notice. And so you say, I know those are not your golf clubs. I know that you came into my garage and stole them. And you know that's wrong, otherwise you wouldn't look guilty right now. But I'm not gonna call the police. And I'm not even sure I wanna get you in trouble with your family. Here's what I wanna do. My boys and I are going to, the, going to the driving range this afternoon. If you want to go, I'll ask your dad. You can come too. What do you say? You can tell by the look on his face that he has no emotional reference points for that kind of response. I mean, who does that? So he picks up the golf clubs and he brings them over to you and he says, I'm sorry, I can't take these. I'm, I can't go with you. And besides, I don't have any clubs. That's why I took them. And you say... Keep the clubs. Just take care of them and don't ever steal again. Now, do you want to go hit some golf balls or what? Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you do not deserve. So can we just be really honest here? Grace sounds stupid, doesn't it? I mean, really? This kid gets away with a minor offense and he'll move on to bigger things. The lesson he will learn is simple. Crime pays. He'll have no qualms about stealing to get what he wants and he'll be on his way to becoming a world-class loser and probably a prison sentence because justice always catches up. Maybe. He might also be so shaken by the experience of grace by somebody taking an interest in his future, by being given a second chance that he does not deserve, that he is fundamentally altered by it, forever changed by grace. In an oldish but excellent book by Bill Hybels called The, Th 
the God you're looking for. Bible says that we make decisions every day about whether we will treat people with justice, mercy, or grace. Every day we make decisions about whether we will treat people with justice, give them what they deserve, mercy, not give them what they deserve, or grace, give them what they do not deserve. But we really cannot entertain the possibility of treating people with surprising, radical grace until we realize just how God has decided to treat us. And how's that? Well, the Bible's pretty blunt. Romans 3.23 says all have sinned. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. There's a price to be paid for sin, and that price is death, and everybody is guilty. We've all stolen the golf clubs. Here's the thing, though. Most of us don't think we're all that bad or that, that we, just, we don't really deserve death. Most people, and maybe even you, think that if you're basically a good person, if you're nice, and on balance do more good than evil if you don't belong to a neo-Nazi white supremacist group, then there's no way God is not going to welcome you into heaven. If you are good enough, you'll be okay. Some of us really believe that if I'm good enough, if you're good enough, we're going to get to go to heaven. Well, if that's true, then all this business about Jesus on the cross is really worthless. If being good enough is good enough, then Jesus died for nothing. Paul, in fact, said so in Galatians 2.21. He said, if righteousness can be gained through the law, that is through living God's standards perfectly, then Christ died for nothing. You remember Mother Teresa? She spent her entire adult life serving the dying poor, the homeless, lepers, the diseased in Calcutta. She owned only the clothes on her back. Everything else she gave away. She prayed a dozen times a day. She never swore. She didn't watch television, didn't go to movies, didn't dance, gamble, smoke, drink, or do drugs. And she was a virgin. Of course, some people think it's a real shame that she wasn't a member of the Church of Christ. (laughs) You know, if life with God really is all about trying to get our good deeds to outweigh our bad deeds, which do you think is going to weigh more? being right on your doctrine or serving those who are hurting, broken, and in need. Jesus came down on the side of serving others every time. But that's really beside the point. It it wouldn't matter if you you added flawless doctrine to Mother Teresa's spiritual resume. At some point in her life, she sinned against God. At some point, she knew which decision God wanted her to make, which direction God wanted her to go, and she made a different choice. She went a different direction. In some way, she shook a fist at God. And in that moment, she sinned. And the Bible says the wages of sin are death. Not even Mother Teresa was good enough to spend eternity in the presence of God, of a holy God. And if she wasn't good enough, you're not good enough. And neither am I. We all deserve to die. We all deserve justice. But that's not what God gives. Psalm 103. I mean, this is in the Old Testament now, right? It's not supposed to be any grace back there, right? He made known his ways to Moses, the psalmist says, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. Look at verse 10 in Psalm 103. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is this love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Luke 15. There's a story there that illustrates how God treats us. It's about a young man who decided to claim his inheritance early before his father died, before he had sufficient maturity to deal with a large sum of money. Essentially, he was telling his father, you're dead to me. I'd rather have your money than your relationship. And he took the money and he journeyed 
as far away from home as he could get to a place so far away, the only thing the Bible ever calls it is the far country. And there he used that money to purchase pleasure and finance fun. And then the money ran out and the economy crashed. And that boy who probably left home because he was sick and tired of farming ended up right back where he started laboring on a farm, a pig farm, which is the nastiest thing besides a chicken farm you can find. The Bible says he was so hungry that he wanted to eat the slop he fed the pigs. Picture that boy in the mud, in the pigsty. He's hungry, he is filthy, he is cold, he is alone, and he is getting exactly what he deserved. That's justice. And that may be where you are right now. Look, I've, I've been there. We made sinful choices, and the consequences of those choices caught up with us, and we ended up in our own pigsties getting exactly what we deserved. We got justice. Well, the boy in the story decided he didn't like justice very much. The Bible says he came to his senses. And so he decided to go home. He figured he could work for his dad, not as a son, but as a hired servant, and at least he'd be home. He could bunk with the other ranch hands, eat with them, work with them. He'd never be a son again, but at least he wouldn't be homeless. He was willing to settle for mercy, which may be where some of us are this morning. We feel more like God's employees than God's children. We live in the insecurity of a business relationship with God, wondering every day if this is the day we get our notice, that we're being downsized. We've settled for a contract when God wants to make a covenant. We have just enough faith to imagine mercy and no idea what's truly available. The boy in the story didn't either. But the Bible says that when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and ran to meet him and embraced him. And then the boy made his request just like he had rehearsed it. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. But before he even finished the sentence, his father was ordering the servants to bring a robe, a ring, and shoes, to fire up the grill and set the table. The son of mine, he said, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's grace. Full reinstallment as a child of God. Undeserved, unmerited, unearned, getting free what you do not deserve. It's the money under the green frog on the front porch of your grandfather. Justice brought him to his senses. Mercy is all he imagined. Grace is what he got. Wonderful, amazing, unbelievable grace. Now, do you really think that boy took off from his father's house the next week and headed back to the far country? Maybe. Grace is a terribly risky thing. It can be abused. It can be taken advantage of. But when we really understand what God has done for us, when grace explodes in our hearts, we are changed. We, we no longer do good to be accepted. We're accepted. Therefore, we do good. We no longer live in fear of losing God's love because of our failure. Because of God's love, we know that no matter how terribly we fail, we can come back home. So does all of that mean that Romans 6.23 is wrong? Has God just ignored that verse, forgotten it? Are the wages of sin no longer being paid? And I wonder if God ever wished he could have just ignored that verse. Wages of sin or death. Eh, let's let that one slide this time. I wonder if God ever wished he could ignore that verse because the price did have to be paid, just not by us. Jesus paid that price for us. And those who give their lives to Jesus in baptism can count his death as their own. So are you getting what you deserve? Are are you being broken by the justice of life for choices you have made? Are you in your own pigsty? 
There is grace, and it's for you. Have you settled for mercy, just not getting what you deserve when grace is really available? Do you feel like you're working for a wage from God, like you're an employee instead of a loved son or daughter? I think there's some of us who have been on the edge of God's family for a very long time, and we're afraid to come into God's family because we don't feel like we deserve it. Let me put this to rest for you. We don't. We don't deserve it. But we are welcome still because of Jesus. You don't have to live on the edges, on the fringes. You can come into the family because of grace. You don't have to act like you're an employee of God. You can live as a loved son or daughter. I don't know what I would have done if I'd ever caught the guy who stole my kid's golf clubs. I just know what God has done for me. And I know that he'll do the same for you. So I want to go ahead and ask our shepherds if they'll will to kind of get around the edges of the room here a little bit, you and your wives, if you, you folks would just make your way to different places around the room. We're going to sing a song here, and this is an opportunity for you if you need to come for prayer. And look, this doesn't mean that you've done something terribly wrong. It just might mean that right now you're living in a, in a state of fear and worry and concern over things going on in your life, and you need somebody to pray over that for you. You're part of this family, and we pray for each other. It may mean that, that there are some issues in your life that you know are outside the will of God. You know they are. Uh, you don't need a preacher to tell you that, that there's sin going on. You're, you feel guilty about it every night when you lie down and try to go to sleep. Let's deal with that. Let's deal with it. You don't have to live with that. This is a very safe church. Trust me. I was welcomed here. You'll be welcomed here. Let's pray over it together. It could be, too, that you're ready to give your life to Christ in baptism. And if you're ready to do that, oh, Lord, we'll be late to lunch and dinner. We'll do whatever it takes to witness that marvelous event where you give your life to Christ in baptism. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to sing. If you need to come, you can go to one of our elders or come to me down front. Oh, Lord, your beauty. Let's go ahead and pray together here. We have several people that have come forward in different places. Let's just bow and ask God's blessings on these folks, and then we'll follow up with them offline. But if you need prayer or you just didn't feel comfortable 
coming forward in this kind of setting, would you please give us a call at the office? And I'm in the church directory. It's my cell phone. Call me. Let's talk. Don't live alone with whatever you're struggling with right now because we serve a God who gives grace. He gives us not what we deserve. He doesn't even prevent us from the things, to take away the things we deserve. He gives us what we don't deserve, his love, his fellowship, his mercy. Let's pray. God, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for this church where you've created such a warm, safe space for us. And we pray that we would be even safer and warmer and more open and loving to everyone. God, thank you for those that are asking for prayer even in this moment and bless them. Bless them with whatever need is going on in their lives and help us to be there for them in in real tangible ways. God, our, our world is full of hatred and violence right now. The latest outbreak that we're aware of is in Charlottesville, Virginia, and we pray for the people there. We pray for the white supremacists, the people whose hearts are filled with hate. We pray for the people who are counter protesting, that they will not succumb to hate. We pray for the police officers who are trying to keep the peace. We pray that you will give them wisdom and discernment to know when to act and when not to. We pray for our country, that you would help us to find ways to heal the racial and class divisions that exist among us. Help us to forgive where we need to forgive, to repent where we need to repent, and to do these in ways that speak to one another and reflect who you are and who you call us to be. Help this church lead by living lifestyles of grace to people around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take a seat. Lincoln's got a couple of announcements he's going to share with you. And I remind you again, Wednesday night, 615, dessert, 630, worship. Hope you'll be there. Hey, we really are glad that you were here this morning, and I hope that you're blessed by having been here, and we hope that the Lord was blessed by our worship this morning. Amen? Uh, Just a couple of things as we close. First is a picture Justin had hair. (laughs) Justin and Sue Satterfield celebrated 60 years of being married together this weekend, and we certainly want to congratulate. Where are you guys? Right over there. Congratulate them. That's the second 60-year couple we've had here recently. Awesome. Good stuff. Uh, The only other thing I want to remind you about is our ice cream social tonight at 5, and we're also going to have a meet the gendrons time with Ashley and Caleb, Uh, so we'll be having some fun and games with them tonight. Please come back, meet them, bring ice cream. We'll be having judged, um, judged categories of fruit and all of them, and prizes. It's going to be huge. And you have to be here at 5 if you want to be judged. That's the important thing. If you come in at 5.15 with your ice cream, sorry, you're out. No winner there. We're just going to eat it, and then you're going to take it home. Okay? So that's it tonight at 5. As always, it's been a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day and a great week. Let's stand as we close in prayer. Let's pray. Most kind Heavenly Father, a great and wonderful God, we are so thankful for your love and for your grace. Father, we, we do look at the world today and we are sad, and we're hurt, and we're scared. And we, we Father, we know that you are too. Uh, the things that we see go around. Father, we just pray this week uh, that we, we look at the world uh, and the people around us with your heart and with your eyes, and that we look for the opportunities you give us to to glorify you and serve others and make this world a better place to live. Father, we we pray and hope that our worship this morning has been acceptable to you. Uh, And Father, we just are so thankful for the grace. And and Father, we know that we're not worthy and we don't understand how you could love uh, us as in all the things that we do that are so unworthy. But, Father, we are thankful that you do and that you have grace and it covers us and that there's nothing that can separate us from your love, Father. And we, 
we're thankful for that. And we hope and pray that we'll glorify you and that uh, our lives will make you proud of us. Father, we thank you for everything that do you do for us and ask you to be with us as we go through the rest of the day and the week. Uh, we love you and, and uh, pray these things in your son's name. And the Lord's church said, amen. amen.